Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Legal Lines, where I'm very pleased to have back on the show our United States Senator David Vitter. David's going to talk to us about some big bills he's gotten through Congress. Particularly, there's a waterways bill that's resulting in the dredging of a lot of our ports, more money to clear the Morganza spillway all the way down to the Gulf, and a lot of other things. Also, a transportation bill that's going to help our bridges and many other roadways. He's also going to talk about running for governor of the state of Louisiana in 2015. Join us on the next Legal Lines with United States Senator David Bitter. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines Tip for you. Buy UM Insurance. Why? UM Insurance stands for uninsured or underinsured insurance coverage, and it's the only insurance you will buy that protects you in the event you're involved in an automobile collision and the other party who hits you and is at fault has either no insurance or minimal insurance. Remember in Louisiana, we only require to get a license and drive that you have at least $10,000 in coverage. So if you have $100,000 in injuries, but they only have $10,000 in coverage, you're out 90 grand, unless you've purchased UM insurance. So number one, buy UM insurance. You can waive it or select lower limits, but do not do that. So the Legal Lines tip from me, Locke Meredith, to you is buy UM insurance. This has been Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Welcome to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and I'm very pleased to have back on the show our United States Senator David Vitter. In fact, we just did one show, and we keep going. There's so much stuff to talk about. David, thanks again. Thank you, Locke. Let's uh, dig right back in. Um, we uh, were talking about uh, basically all the external threats to our country and yeah. the effect that it's had internally. Um, let's also talk about the cap and trade yeah. stuff that is being proposed by the president, his administration, and the EPA. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't feel like our economy and our people can take another hit like this. No, you know, like when you look at great powers historically, they're, they usually decline because of internal threats, not external. And so some of our internal threats, I think, are even more wor worrisome. And at the top of the list in my mind is, is a really lousy recovery. It's a slow, jobless recovery. And I think the biggest reason is at the federal level, President Obama and others are piling on uh, masses of, of new regulation, over-regulation. That's a real dead weight long term on our economy. And that's a problem in terms of growing, creating jobs. And a big example of that is in the environmental sector. Uh, like nobody, uh, nobody debates that we all want clean air, clean water. We all want that vigilance, but I'm talking about uh, lots of new regulations which have minimal, if any, environmental impact positively, but a whole lot of cost, a whole lot of impact on the economy. Well, and we, we just sat here and talked about the effect of, of, the, of Iran or these yeah. Islamic extremists taking over oil over there, how yeah. Russia's blackmailing the yeah. Ukraine saying, we're not going to send you gas. Yeah. And we need to be energy independent to Absolutely. help ourselves and our friends overseas, other nations Absolutely. of the world. Absolutely. And there's one thing and that stands- And we're not stand, doing it. Yeah, there's one we're thing that stands in the way of that, and that's our federal government. Unbelievable. <laughs> that's the only thing that stands in the way of really true energy independence. I mean, as I understand it, uh, these regulations are destroying the coal producing electricity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're mostly talking about these new greenhouse gas regulations. Uh, the administration can't pass anything like that through Congress, can never pass a cap and trade bill. Couldn't pass it through the Senate no. or the House. No, they couldn't. You're exactly right. A few years ago, they tried to pass it through the Democratic Senate couldn't pass it there. And so they're just trying to do all of this by administrative fiat. And that is really putting the coal industry out of business, hurting large sectors of the economy and spiking everybody's electricity costs. And so folks understand coal is one of the, the sources to yeah. basically create energy, to create yeah. the steam, sure. to turn the turbines. Yeah. And as I understand it, our electricity needs are provided by about 40% of those type of plants, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a major factor in terms of the overall mix to produce American electricity. And you know, Locke, it's one thing to have a glide path away from that over time to develop new resources, new options over time. But this is nothing like that. This is a very aggressive war on coal that's going to have an impact short term, not just medium or long term, including, including really spiking 
uh, electricity Electrical. costs. People's electricity yeah. bills are going to go yeah. up, and so we, are businesses, so and is And we everybody. shouldn't be surprised. President Obama, if you remember, in an editorial board meeting when he was running for president, Dopsy? said, under my plan, energy prices will skyrocket. Electricity costs will skyrocket. He said that pure and simple. And, and here we go. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm reading already that, for example, here in Baton Rouge, we get an EPA yeah. Yeah. Uh, letter saying, hey, you got to reduce it by 40 percent, right. your CO2 production right. by 40 percent, and right. we don't even use a lot of coal here. No, no. And that threatens us, particularly in the Baton Rouge area, like, as you know, we just worked out of what's called non-attainment in the last few years. We just got out of that non-attainment category so we can begin to expand in terms of job creating industrial projects. Now these new regs could put us back into non-attainment again and that will put the brakes on a lot of exciting job creating projects that would otherwise come to this area. And so to summarize, electricity prices go up for everybody. Yeah. We, the businesses lose money. They can't hire as many people. Yeah. We can't be as competitive globally because yeah. our products less job serves. creation, higher energy prices. But apart from that, it's a great idea. What, so how in the world does the EPA, which is only an agency of the administrative, one third of yeah. the branch of government, yeah. have the power to tell everyone what to do, David? Yeah. I don't understand this. Is this legal? Well, uh, I don't think it is locked in many cases, uh, but, but we're seeing this more and more. President Obama has pledged that he's going to act administratively. You know, he's going to use his pen, he's going to use his phone, and he's not going to wait on Congress. Uh, that's fine if it's within his legitimate power. And the president has significant powers. That's right. And there are, there are executive orders that are valid, but it's absolutely inappropriate. It, it's, it's illegal when he's going contrary to statute, when he's going beyond his powers. And I think that's what's happening in many cases. Now the problem is he does this with a stroke of a pen. We need to fight to undo it each and every time with a three year, three million dollar lawsuit that goes up to the right. US Supreme Court. So it is a that's very, very uneven playing field. Unbelievable. And, and so at this point, our, our remedy is to litigate. Yeah, um, we're doing everything we can in Congress to push back. But unfortunately, in the Harry Reid Senate, you know, that is stopped basically on a party line vote. Hopefully that will change in the fall election and we'll have more ability if we have a Republican majority Senate to push back. But short of that, uh, we need to bring it to court. And unfortunately, again, that's a very uneven playing field. Let's talk about uh, what one of your major accomplishments. Um, yeah. Let's point out that you are the top Republican yeah. on the uh, Environment, Environment and Public, Public Works so Committee. Okay. And that basically covers two big areas, everything EPA related and also everything infrastructure related. Now on the EPA side, unfortunately, uh, you know, we've been talking about my frustrations and we've not been that successful as conservatives pushing back. But all, what, all 41 or 42 oh, folks yeah. sent a letter saying yeah. no. Oh yeah, uh, conservatives, Republicans are unified but unfortunately we're the minority in the Harry Reid Senate. Okay. However, on that committee, on the infrastructure side, we've actually done some positive things on a bipartisan basis, including a big water resources bill, uh, including a highway bill, which we just passed out of committee. Also, this doesn't include that committee, but related to that is uh, the flood insurance fix. Big which deal we're able, here. Yeah, big, big deal in South Louisiana. We were able to pass that about six weeks ago. So let's talk about the, the well, let's stay on that, the yeah. flood insurance. Explain yeah. to folks, because FEMA had come out with a new map, yeah. basically everybody's land floods yeah. and insurance was yeah. skyrocketing. About a year and a half ago, uh, Congress passed Bigger Waters, which was a reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program. And we needed to reauthorize it long term, and we needed to make some changes. However, what passed once it began to be implemented uh, was creating in some cases, sky-high unaffordable premium increases that nobody had predicted. And so many in Congress, certainly including me, said, well, wait, time out. Uh, you know, we expected modest rate increases to stabilize the system. Nobody talked about these unaffordable rate increases that in some cases could literally push folks out of their homes because they couldn't afford the mandatory flood insurance. So we said time out set about trying to fix that. This took eight months of discussion and finally got an important reform effort 
passed into law. Excellent. All right, we'll continue this on the next segment. This is Lock Mayor Legal Lines. Our United States Senator David Vitter will be right back. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines Tip for you. Document your claim. What do I mean? Whenever you present a claim, whether it's for injuries in an automobile collision or for a breach of contract case or a business claim, it all boils down to documentation and evidence. For example, when you go to trial, basically both sides are presenting their evidence of what they believe to be their case. For example, also, if you're involved in an automobile collision, document the event. Talk to all the parties who are involved. Get their names, address, contact information, insurance info. Talk to the witnesses on the scene. Also get their contact information. Take photographs with the phones we all have these days. Everybody can take a picture and that paints a thousand words. So document your claim. The Legal Lines tip from me, Locke Meredith, to you is document the claim. This has been Legal Lines Tips. Welcome back to Legal Lines. Again, I'm very pleased to have back on the show our United States Senator David Vitter. David, let's dive back in and Absolutely. thanks so much for doing it. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's talk about the water bill yeah. uh, because that's, that's a big deal. It, it helped Louisiana in a lot of ways. Explain to the folks how. Yeah, as I said, uh, some of my main work in the Senate is on this infrastructure and environment committee. I happen to be the top ranking Republican. And on the infrastructure side, we actually work very well on a bipartisan basis on the committee. The biggest result of that recently was a so-called word, a Water Resources Development Act, a big bill that uh, addressed water issues. Now, what does that mean? That means Corps of Engineers projects, hurricane flood protection levees. in Louisiana, levees. Floodways. Uh, that means coastal restoration. Corps projects involve coastal restoration. Uh, that means core reform, trying to get that agency straight. I remember so you telling me do, it was a nightmare to get oh those yeah. guys to do anything. Absolutely. 30 years. So we've instituted some significant core reform in the bill. And the fourth big thing it means is maritime dredging, doing the things we need to do for the maritime economy, which is very important to Louisiana, which is a port state. Does that help all of our ports like New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Iberia, Ab all of them? Absolutely all of our ports throughout Louisiana, particularly in South Louisiana. Again, we're a big maritime, right. we're a big port state. Uh, we need dredging dollars to keep that commerce flowing. We need other activities. So we were m able to move forward with many significant things in this word of bill, and it was just signed into law by President Obama last week. Excellent. And I yeah. think you were actually there. I mean, yes, you, you I was. worked really hard and on this. For That's obvious, not something that you would normally do. No, for obvious reasons. I have not been to the White House in a while, but I was there for the signing ceremony. Because you were, as I read, read this stuff, I mean, you've been in the middle of that one for a long time. Yeah, I was you, the lead Republican. You met with the House, too, <clears throat> right. uh, to reconcile the two bills right. and make sure that Louisiana was right. protected. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, point out to the folks that, as I understand it, Morgan's is now going to be cleaned out all the way to the Gulf? Yeah, a big project uh, for protection, hurricane flood protection, well, is called Morgan's to the Gulf. And that will protect uh, Lafourche, Terrebonne, surrounding areas, which have really little to no flood protection right now. Big populated area with very inadequate hurricane flood protection. So we fully authorize this project, and that's going to move forward. It's called Morganza to the Gulf. And then the last component I yeah. read uh, was about making sure we had safe drinking water. And yeah, um, again, another part of the water bill is uh, those uh, projects and, and priorities that make sure we do have safe, reliable drinking water. That's not primarily a federal government responsibility, but there are some ways that the feds can help. All right, shifting gears to the transportation bill. Yeah. Again, uh, and uh, basically what we're talking about is money's been allocated to, to be spent in the ways that you've been thoroughly involved, right. intricately involved. Yeah, as soon as we finish this water resources bill, the committee immediately turned to the highway bill. And we need to act on a new highway bill by August. If we don't by August, the National Highway Program is going to really come to a screeching halt. So we need to reauthorize that and move forward with uh, an adequate highway program. I always hate reading about, you know, we always seem to be in a lot of ways yeah. down at the bottom of the list. Yeah. We're 10th worst in terms of yeah. bridges in Louisiana and 25th uh, yeah. worst in terms of traffic in New well, Orleans, Baton Rouge. Yeah, certainly everybody in the Baton Rouge area knows that because Amen. we live with traffic congestion and headaches every day. We have the 
only little stretch of I-10 that's one lane. Probably knew that from Jacksonville, <laughs> right. Jacksonville, Florida to Los Angeles, California. The only part of I-10 that's one lane is in Baton Rouge. That, that's just a metaphor for our broader issues, but we need to do something about infrastructure and congestion here and in other parts of the state. And so y'all have dedicated billions of dollars and yes. how it's to be spent, what, over the next decade or six years or something? Yeah, to, uh, the, the bill isn't finally passed. We did our part in this committee. We reported a good bipartisan bill out of committee about three weeks ago on not just a bipartisan basis, a unanimous basis. However, other committees have other parts of the bill, including the toughest part, which is the financing piece. So we're trying to help those committees piece together a responsible way to address the highway program. All right, excellent. So hopefully Senate passes yeah. it, House still got to do it, then yeah. it goes to the president. Yeah. All right. Tell the folks about what you've been doing to protect our military bases here, uh, because that's a big deal for Louisiana. It is a big deal. It's a big deal for the country. I'm worried that we're cutting uh, too much on the military side. Every part of the federal government can be cut, uh, can be trimmed. Uh, but I'm afraid we're not doing it the right way at the Pentagon and we're really impacting readiness. And it's also a big deal in terms of Louisiana. We have significant bases at Barksdale and Shreveport, Bossier, Fort Polk in central Louisiana, and the naval base on the west bank of the greater New Orleans area. And so that has an impact on our Louisiana economy as well. So I've been working hard to protect those national interests and those Louisiana interests as a member of the Armed Services Committee. And I read that, that in your view, there's 25 billions of waste that's been identified by other sources that-, that There we're... is. You know, it's unfortunately typical Washington. Whenever we cut, which isn't near uh, often enough, it's all these across the board cuts that impact necessary things like manpower right. and readiness absolutely as much as the waste, fraud, and abuse that's going on. We need to get into the weeds of the budget and not just cut things across the board, but understand where real waste, fraud, and abuse is and what programs we can do away with completely rather than giving everything a haircut Makes or, sense. or a more significant cut. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. Sure. I, I know that you announced, I believe, January of this yes. year that you yeah. and your family, Wendy, uh, have yeah. decided to go ahead and run for governor of Louisiana. Why? Right. Well, uh, that's going to be next year, so it is a little ways away, but after talking about it for quite a while, Wendy and I decided that I could have a bigger positive impact as our next governor, just more opportunity to really lead in a positive way, to take on the challenges we face as a state, take advantage of what I think are some really exciting opportunities. It's sort of being a CEO versus a member of the board in a legislative body. So I'm real excited about taking on those challenges. I, uh, I love what I read in the, in the sense that it, kind of one of your mottos is you're going to listen and you're going to learn and then you're going to lead. And that sounds like a, a nice philosophy to have that you, you, you know that it takes uh, surrounding yourself with great people. A absolutely. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to decide relatively early is so that I would have this whole calendar year to really think about the job and really do my homework and really listen and learn, as you said. Um, and I am doing a lot of that this year, listening and learning. Most of that is in a, in a pretty informal way with roundtables and meetings and discussions among all sorts of folks around Louisiana. However, we are organizing five uh, more forum, formal leadership forums coming up between uh, now and September all around the state on key topics. So that will really help me in that listening and learning process. But again, come next year, when a real campaign gets underway, I will lead. I'm not doing this to avoid the big <laughs> issues. I'm really doing it to take them on and to try to gather folks around our leadership and do important things in the state. Well, and as a United States Senator for Louisiana, you've held, what, well over 300 town halls yeah. and then I think over 300 phone call conferences yeah, is what you call Yeah, about 365 town halls, uh, not that many telephone town halls, about 150, but do those to reach out to folks on Excellent. a very regular basis. All right, well, we'll continue this on the last segment. Yeah. This is Lock Merritt with Legal Lines. Our United States Senator, David Bitter, will be right back. It's time now for Legal Lines Tips with your host, Locke Meredith. 
Hello, I'm Locke Meredith with a Legal Lines tip for you. Never sign a settlement document without first seeing an attorney. You often can see an attorney for free, at least on the first visit. Knowledge is power. Learn what it is that you're signing and the consequences of signing that document are. Remember, once you sign a settlement document, regardless of whether it's contractual, business claim, or personal injury claim, it's over. You will no longer have rights. You can no longer file a lawsuit. You better know what your consequences are. You better make sure you're being fully compensated. And remember, oftentimes, there are obligations that you have once you sign that contract. So from me, Locke Meredith, to you, the Legal Lines tip is never sign a settlement document without first seeing an attorney. This has been Legal Lines Tips. Welcome back to Legal Lines. Again, I'm very pleased to have on the show again our United States Senator David Vitter. David, Thank thanks you, again. Mike. And you were, Thank you you. were talking about running for governor. Yep. Uh, and, and you your platform of, of listening, learning, and then leading. Yeah. T tell the folks what that means. I know you're, you're having some yeah. discussions with groups now. Yeah, just today I'm going to the press club and I'm really going to lay out uh, what I've been, uh, how, how I've been approaching that, how I've been listening and learning around the state since my announcement in January, and what the next step will be. And the next step, part of it, is going to be five leadership forums on our future around the state. Uh, where I gather leaders and uh, opinion leaders and experts in a number of topics uh, and really pick their brains and, and listen on a number of topics around the state. That's going to cover K-12 through education, okay. higher ed, uh, building jobs in the economy and getting the skilled workforce to fill those jobs. Because right now there's, there's arguments by businesses, we don't have the oh, yeah. workforce that's, they need, right? That, that's a clear need. So that's clearly going to be one of our big challenges, particularly in the next five years. Also infrastructure, we're talking about that. That's, That's right. a key to economic growth. Uh, and finally, healthcare. Uh, perfecting, if you will, getting right these public-private hospital partnerships and also Medicaid reform. And the groups that you meet with, they are specifically educated on each of those platforms? Yeah, we're going to have a, a diverse group of leaders and experts on each of those topics. They're going to be held around the state, two in Baton Rouge, one in Monroe, one in Shreveport, Bossier, one in Lafayette, and it's going to be between now and September. So I'm really looking forward to those five leadership forums on our future, but that certainly won't be the end of my homework. I'm going to also be doing outreach and engagement in a less formal way. You know, it's interesting too because uh, I know when you were a state legislator here in Louisiana, not in the federal yeah. world, yeah. Um, you led the charge for term limits yep. uh, and to make politicians accountable. Yep. And you've pledged, as I read, that that this is the last office that you'll ever yep. run for, public office you'll run for, or even be appointed to? Absolutely. Yeah, I said when I announced that if I'm uh, honored uh, to, to be elected to this uh, governor's job, it's going to be my last political job elected or appointed, period. And I really mean it, period. <laughs> You've had no enough after ifs, this, ands, huh? or buts. <laughs> And the reason I thought it was important to say that is, is to let people know uh, I'm not doing this as a stepping stone. I'm not doing it to have a nice title and cut ribbons. I'm doing it, I think, for the right reasons, to really take on the key challenges we face as a state. Doesn't mean I'll get everything right, but that is absolutely going to be my sole motivation, to really take on those key challenges with a team around me. It's definitely a team sport. And to do things for the right reasons, for the, uh, to advance all of Louisiana from our best and brightest to our most vulnerable. So I want to point out to the folks your educational background because it's outstanding. It's unique in the fact it. that you, you know, you pa uh, got past uh, law school there at Tulane, Tulane and yeah. then you attended uh, Oxford in England yep. Yep, and also Harvard years. here, Rhodes yeah. Scholar, yeah. Uh, and economics was your, your specialty other yeah. than law. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Some of those experiences... Um, uh, you know, place like Harvard, pretty liberal place, that actually helped me become, I think, the conservative <laughs> I am today. That and living in England for two years, uh, which was has been overtaken by socialism largely since World War II. So that was uh, an important ex set of experiences as I became a conservative. So, David, what what would you say is your vision 
for Louisiana. Knowing, knowing where we sit today, the governor has brought in billions and billions of yeah. dollars, Governor Jindal, yeah. of investment with Sasol and these yeah. different companies. Well, well, first of all, because of that, Locke, I think we are in a real moment of exciting opportunity. I think we're going to have great opportunities in this state. But to take full advantage of them, we need to really get some things right, starting with education. K through 12 education, our kids need to do way better. Right, right. now, only about 23% of our third graders are reading at grade level. I mean, that's ludicrous. One out of four. That, yes, less than one out of four. That is ludicrous. So we need to address that. We need to stabilize higher education through stabilizing the budget. We need to build that infrastructure I mentioned to be a healthy backbone of our economy. But if we start lining those things up, getting some of those key factors right, I think the sky's the limit in terms of the success we can enjoy in Louisiana. Well, and you said this multiple times on prior shows that we as a, a state have been blessed with abundant natural resources Absolutely. in terms of gas and oil, particularly gas, Absolutely. and with the new technology. Yep. We are just busting at the seams in yeah. a lot of places. Yeah, we're moving into an American energy renaissance, an exciting period for our country in terms of energy if the federal government gets out the way and Louisiana can be an economic leader in that regard. And I assume that you, with your experience on the committees that you've been on in dealing with the federal government and the fact that Right now, it feels like states are constrained by the federal government to yeah. dive into our energy and protect us from other countries who hate our guts. Yeah, we're way too constrained. Hopefully, we'll be peeling back those constraints. But there is opportunity to really take aggressive advantage of those energy opportunities here in Louisiana. How, how do you view um, what's ha taking place? It, because you are a conservative. Yeah. And I know, you know, we had uh, the House uh, Majority Leader Cantor oh, yeah. lose yeah. his position yeah. uh, to yeah. a, a guy who was a, what, a history professor, right. I believe. Right. Um, well, to, fascinating events taking place. Yeah, it was a surprise to everybody. To me, that, that shows how frustrated and upset people are by Washington in general. And certainly conservatives want to see folks fighting for constructive change, pushing back on growing government, pushing back on loss of freedoms. And I think Eric Cantor's biggest mistake was, was quite frankly, just being too much of an insider and not aggressively fighting that fight every day. That's fantastic. Um, uh, David, we appreciate your service to, Thank you, to, to all of us in Thanks. the state. Thank you very much for being on the Thank show. Thank you very much. This is Lock Mayor with Legal Lines and our United States Senator, David Vitter, who's running for governor of Louisiana. Thanks for being with us.